I'm excited to be here. If you have your Bibles, please grab those and get to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm already encouraged this morning because I woke up today just feeling... Just in, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me the message I had prepared for the Berlin Church this afternoon just wasn't the one I was supposed to give here. And so I got my computer out and started working on shaping one for you all. And was still, when I left, when I left the apartment, I was like, I still don't know which one I'm supposed to give. And so I asked Franz about it, and um, he said, go with the 2 Timothy 3 one. So I felt good. And, uh, and the, the whole theme, the whole introduction is about finding a solid rock in an easy word. And then they said, we're going to do a new song this morning. We started singing about solid rock. I was like, okay, so the Lord's behind something today. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm grateful. I feel like... I feel like we're in His will today, so um, we're excited to do that. So I'm going to ask you just to join me in a word of prayer as we launch out in this. Father, we are grateful, so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, God, we could be anywhere right now, but we get to be here with brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to open Your Word. We get to worship You, have a time of discussion. Lord, all of this, all of this comes to us by Your grace, and it's all for our benefit. And so we're thankful uh, for this uh, for this chance. And so. As we turn to your word, I pray that you would be the one who speaks the loudest. Um, your spirit would move unhindered to this place. Um, God, that you would get the glory from all this. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. So for most of this year, I've been seeing a, a specialist back in the States to get some help with my back. I've got lots of back issues. And, and going there, um, they, they've helped a lot, but I've, I experienced something entirely new. Um, I'd go there and I'd get therapy and, and, and uh, chiropractic adjustments, all of which I'd had before. But before I would leave, the, the new thing is they would put me on this machine called a whole body vibration machine. And it's a machine that you step onto and then there's paddles in the bottom that they, they begin to pulsate, and I mean violently, very quickly. Um, and the idea is, is to aggressively shake up your entire body because it forces your uh, muscles to contract and relax dozens of times per second. It enhances blood flow, it reduces soreness from the therapy, it aids in whatever corrective measure uh, that occurred that day, lasting longer, at least this is what they told me when they threw it on there, right? And so, <laughs> I don't know if any of that's true, but it sounded great, so I jumped on. And every time there's a 10 minute session, and I've uh, gotten to the point where they, they turn the machine up to maximum speed, right? So it's really high, it's not the most uh, flattering of looks, right? If you quickly learn where you're toned and where you're not, you know, uh, it's it's, but it's not uncomfortable, and it, and it goes really fast, honestly. But there's there's a moment that I enjoy every time. It's my favorite moment is when the timer goes off and the session is done, and it's that first step back onto what I call solid ground. It's not moving, it's not shaking, it's not pulsating wildly, and and every time there's just like a relief and a calmness from just everything being steady again. It's, just, it's such a sharp contrast to the whole body vibration machine. Second Timothy's letter from Paul to his young protege Timothy, he's, he's, left him, he's left Timothy in charge of a very difficult assignment. He's, he's the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And, and we're going to be in chapter 3 this morning. And in chapter 3, he's been uh, going back and forth between what Timothy is facing and what Timothy will face in the future. And none of it's good, right? It had, to be, it had to feel like the ground beneath Timothy was, was constantly shaking. In this letter, we, we read in chapter 1 that everyone who is in the province of Asia has deserted the truth. So that means he's surrounded by false teachers everywhere he looks. All right, chapter 2 is all about a whole group of people who want to oppose Timothy and get him off mission. Chapter 3 has been about misplaced love in the church and false teachers coming in and worming their way in and persecution coming with it. And I think one of the most sober parts of, of reading this letter is, is how easily we can identify with it. Because there's nothing solid and there's nothing steady about the world that we find ourselves in. If you, if you tracked the views of societies throughout history, you know that uh, historically society, societal views have always been shifting. But in the age of the internet... In the age of social media, everything is now sped up. It happens much quicker. There, there are things that have mass acceptance and are celebrated today that would be unheard of not even five years ago. 
And so there's these constantly shifting, constantly changing narratives, and it can feel like everything's in chaos. Where everywhere we step, we're stepping onto unsettled, shifting ground beneath our feet. But what we get to see today is that there's an antidote to all of this. That in the midst of all the shaking ground around him, Paul pointed Timothy to a solid rock that he could always return to. And the great news is that you and I, we have the same solid rock. Where we can go and we can find steadiness and find peace and find calm. And most importantly, find truth. Because the rock is unchanging and it's eternal and it's timeless. And so if you feel like the complications of life are speeding up, if you're just overwhelmed as a follower of Jesus, if you feel like the ground beneath you is the furthest thing from steady right now, there's some really good news for you today. And if I'm going to invite you to look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to start reading in verse 14 and read verse 17. If you're physically capable, would you please stand with me to honor the reading of God's word this morning? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. You can have a seat. Thank you. All right, so just to recap real quick, chapter 3 has been all about difficult times ahead for Timothy. But here in verse 14, there's a reason I started reading that verse, is there's a, a shift in tone, right? Where, where Tip, Paul is now going to tell Timothy what he's to do about all of this, about all the problems he's facing and all the problems he's going to face in the future. And there's some really sweet relief in it. Right? He, he doesn't tell Timothy, you're going to have to come up with brand new strategies. You have to reinvent the will. What he tells him is this. Just continue. Just continue in what you've already learned and what you already believe in. And he points him to the scriptures. Right? And the first thing that we can see here is that the scriptures have been inspired by God. All right, that's verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired literally means, it means breathed out. They were breathed out by the Lord. And this is an important content, or, or, a concept for us to grasp because it's clarifying. Right? The Bible you have in your hands this morning goes from Genesis to Revelation. Right? There's 66 books in here. Uh, and these 66 books were written by approximately 40 different authors over 1,500 years. And so these, these authors, they had a variety of professions and upbringings. Uh, some were prophets, some were priests. There are those that were shepherds. There was a tent maker and a physician and a fisherman and a tax collector. All right, so in every book, you can catch uh, the distinct personality and writing style and flair that each author brings to their book. All right, David's poetic. Paul is, is eloquent. Uh, James just cuts right to the point. Right? Luke lays out facts like he's arguing a case in front of a jury. John's really philosophical. But you know what's fascinating? That those 40 authors over 1,500 years all tell the same narrative. They all proclaim the same one true God. They all point to the same one way of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And they don't ever contradict each other. In fact, the Bible's in air. And the, and the reason why is we see right here, it's divine inspiration. That when those human authors are writing what would become the books of the Bible, God inspired, he breathed out the words they wrote. Now, he didn't Dictate it. He didn't erase each author's unique style. But they still wrote exactly what God intended them to put in his word. Nothing more, nothing less. And there's a notion that people have to kind of scoff at that, get skeptical at that, uh, at that idea. And, and, and that's you. I, I'd like to give you a challenge. I'd like you to start writing a story today and then pass it on to 39 other authors over the next 1,500 years. And a good handful of these authors won't even know the rest of you exist and you all have to write a story that's inerrant, that does not contradict itself and have the same central theme throughout them. Mm -hmm. And if you think human beings can do that without divine inspiration, that's having much more faith than believing that God inspired his word. And here's why this is important. An, an eternal God inspired a timeless word. First Peter 1 tells us that all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. 
The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. As Peter saying, people come and people go. Like all those authors of Scripture, they all came, they all lived their earthly lives, and they all passed, so they couldn't write anymore. No. Every preacher of the gospel, every proclaimer of the good news of Jesus, they've all come and they've all passed. But God's word is eternal. God's word is timeless. It says true and relevant and powerful and authoritative today as the day that it was written. Which means that everything else that Timothy has promised about the scriptures here are still true and applicable to us. So the second thing Paul tells them is that not just that the scriptures are inspired by God, but that God's word is profitable. If you continue on in verse 16, right, he says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Right, the, the word he writes there, it means useful, it means beneficial, it means to your gain. Now, if I, ever, if I ever really nerd out on something, it would always be sports. And so there's a newer stat being tracked in the NBA back in the States, right? It's, it's called plus minus. Right, if, you, if you track basketball at all, you know that for years we, we've counted how many points somebody has, how many assists somebody has, how many remedy somebody has. But this is kind of a more nerdy, geeky level, right? And the concept is simple, that when you're on the floor, is your team winning or losing? So it gives a fuller picture than just points and rebounds. So if, if I check into a game and my team is up 20 points, then when I check out of the game, we're only up 8, I get a minus 12. Right? If I check in the game and we're down 30 and I leave and we're only down 20, I get a plus 10. And the question being asked by the stat is, is this player beneficial or profitable to the team's success or not? Right? Do these lineups work? I tell you that today this. If there's a ministry plus minus, Paul is telling Timothy, there is no greater plus in the scriptures. And you call, if you recall everything that Paul, uh, if you know everything that Paul has been challenging Timothy to do in these two letters, you read First and Second Timothy, it's in this list. All these things that he lists, he, he's challenged Timothy to do in these letters, and Paul is letting him know that the scriptures are sufficient for each of them. First he says teaching. If Timothy was to teach his church anything, it was to be God's word. He had at his disposal the Old Testament scriptures in the Apostles' teaching, which is now the New Testament. This was to be the foundation of his teaching. It was not to be his opinion. It wasn't to be based on his personality or flair and some self-help thrown in or whatever soapbox Timothy wanted to rant on that day. He wasn't to rely on his own wisdom. He wasn't to rely on his own intellect or cleverness. He was to use the scriptures. It's impossible to look at the section without looking back at chapter 2, verse 2. And so look at me in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Where Paul writes, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So when Paul says, What you've heard from me in the presence of many, that, that, that's Paul's teachings. Right? It's not one on one, it's public proclamation. He said, You've heard my teaching. Now, do the same. It must be the same for you because the scriptures were the root of all I taught. This same standard applies to all churches today. Right? The scriptures must be the source and foundation of our teaching. Right? We, we, it's not helpful to do things like 10 ways you can have more peace in your life and somewhere in there throw a Bible verse or two to support a sub point. Now our teaching needs to flow from the scriptures. And so my advice to anybody is to avoid the teachers and preachers who avoid God's word. Teaching must flow from the scriptures. Secondly, it's profitable for rebuking. Now, rebuking just means to correct those who are in sin. And again, right, the scriptures must be our guide in this. And there are, there are two major ways. First, Jesus actually gives us a formula, a path for rebuke to follow. I'm going to read that for you. Matthew chapter 18. He says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, then take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. And if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and tax collector to you. Now, I love the, the simplicity and grace that is balanced with truth there. And Jesus says when, there, when it's time to rebuke, don't, don't go public first. Right? Go directly to the person in need of it and approach them privately and humbly. If there's no repentance, take a couple others with you. If that still doesn't work, then you get the church and you get the elders involved. And if that doesn't work, 
then that's the time that you were free to let that relationship have its distance. Not out of spite, but out of hopes of future restoration. God, Jesus literally gives us the game plan to follow for this, right? And so the second way, major way the scriptures help us in rebuke is this. That rebuke must be done to the standards of God's word. Right? We, we don't need to go around rebuking people for disagreements on minor matters, or difference of opinion, or because they did something that we didn't like. Right? Rebuke is reserved when someone is claiming the name of Jesus and living in violation to God's word. It's the scriptures that are the standard for us to meet, nothing else. And so you can see how the scriptures are involved in the entire process. They inform us when it's needed, and they give us a game plan to do it. They're profitable for teaching, they're profitable for rebuking, and he says they're profitable for correcting. Now this is not correcting those who are in sin like rebuking, it's correcting those who are in error. This is, something, this is somebody who's teaching things that are false, right? And this is... If you read 1 and 2 Timothy, this is a major theme of what Timothy has to do. There's a lot of false teaching happening in Ephesus. And it should be obvious to us how the scriptures play again the leading role in this. Right? Without a standard for truth, we can't ever know what's false. And if you don't know what truth is, you will never be able to spot a lie. And so the God-breathed, inspired, and errant word of God is our source of truth. It's our foundation. It's our authority. And so whenever someone is teaching something that contradicts God's word or takes it out of context or twists it, then we use the scriptures to call that out and bring that teaching back in line. So it's useful for rebuking, for correcting. And then he says in training. Right? Training in righteousness, just, it literally just means discipling. This is helping people look more and more like Jesus. It's increasing their affection for Christ and their obedience to Christ. And again, it should be pretty clear how the scriptures are our best tool for this. How do we help believers grow? How do we learn the ways of Jesus? How do we understand God's design for our lives and our homes? How can we even know what righteousness is? Well, it's the living word of God that reveals it to us. Which is why it should be no surprise that it's not just profitable, but God's word also equips us. See, when it came to Paul's development of Timothy... And the challenges that he gave him and the commands that are in these letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, Paul didn't pull a single punch. He didn't lower any standards. He didn't try to make anything easier for Timothy. There's not one time he gives him an easy way out. In fact, you almost get a full sense of what Paul saw in Timothy just in the idea that he left him in Ephesus. But to trust him with that big of a challenge was an honor. And there's a reason for that. Paul's trust was in the faithfulness of God. And his trust was in the deposit of scriptures into Timothy's life. He was sure of Timothy's commitment to and dependence on the scriptures. And because of those confidences, he knew that God would give Timothy all he'd ever need to succeed. Look again at verse 17. He says, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That word complete just means mature. It means trained up. It means equipped for service. The idea is this, that the better we know the Word of God, the better we can live for Him. The better we know God's Word, the better we can serve Him. So you're facing a big decision? Are you going through a trial and you feel stuck or confused or lost or overwhelmed? You feel trapped and it might even be by your own doing? And the advice is the same every time. Get in the Scriptures. Let the God-breathed living word speak life to your bones and peace to your soul and wisdom to your mind and, and knowledge to your circumstance. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. You see, we're like Timothy. He's like us. We were created by a God who prepared good things ahead of time for us to do for Him in His name and for His kingdom. And so how do we discover those? Well, how, how do we prepare for those? How are we equipped for those? How will we ever succeed in those? Well, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable so that we may be mature and complete and equipped for every good work. God's Word is inspired. It is profitable. It equips us to serve Him. Which is why there are three challenges I want to give you in response to these truths. And the first is this. Just elevate your view of the Bible. Now, reading everything that came after, it's no surprise that in verse 15, 
Paul refers to God's word as the sacred scriptures. I love that word sacred. Sacred is how we should view the scriptures. The Bible doesn't need to be explained away. It doesn't need to be apologized for. It doesn't need to be embarrassed about. It needs to be honored and cherished and upheld. And there are plenty of ways to do that without being superior or antagonistic to those who don't believe like we do. But in our graciousness and in our deference, I don't ever want us to feel badly about God's word. Because this is a current uh, strategy of the enemy in our society. There are, there are several concepts like headship or sexuality where the messaging against what God's word says is, is so strong and so loaded that Christians who believe God's word almost feel like we have to apologize for it or meekly stand behind it. And I don't ever want you to feel that way. Look again at what Paul tells Timothy in, in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He says, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Be gentle, yes. Be gracious, yes. Be patient, yes. But apologetic about what God says in his word? No. After all, you didn't write it. And the one who did inspired every word. He knows more than all the rest of us combined. And so we find our freedom, we find our joy, we find our confidence in the sacred scriptures that are true and beneficial. We honor God's word and we hold it in reverence. And we grant it the authority that it has. The second challenge is this, to, to let God's word go to work on you. And look, look again in, in verse 16 how it's profitable. It's proper for teaching and doctrine. It's proper for rebuke and correction and training. I read a commentary and put it in a more simple folksy way. It said the Bible tells us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. James chapter 1 says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone who looks at his own face in a mirror and for look, he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. Do you know the Bible is the only book that reads us while we read it? It reveals to us what is right. right? It gives us wisdom how to stay right. It shows us what isn't right in us. It equips us and trains us and matures us and prepares us for every good thing that God will ever ask of us. And so let it go to work. There's a decision that we make every single time that we're exposed to truth. We either soften ourselves to it and receive it, or we harden our hearts towards it and reject it. Which is why, and this is of great irony, the Church of Jesus has the likely, highest likelihood of having people with really hard hearts in it. Because they're exposed to truth more often than most, and so they have more opportunities to harden themselves to it than most. Which is why pretty much every church I've ever been in or been to has... Someone who's been there for years and has a really hard, cold heart. Because the temptation is so prevalent. But it does not need to be so. If we honor God's word, then we'll approach it with humility. We'll invite the living word of God to go to work on us. To let it reveal what needs revealing. To repent of what it points out to us. And ask the Lord to transform us through his truth. And it'll be profitable for us. Which is why the third challenge is this, to have a lifelong relationship with the Word of God. And the better we know God's Word, the better we know God. The better we know God, the better we can live for God. And the better we live for God, the better we're working for Him. And if we starve ourselves from this Word, we starve our souls from the nourishment it needs. And the worse we know God, then simple, the worse we live for Him and serve Him. So if you're in a good season right now, you have a vibrant relationship with God's Word, Keep it up. Like don't, don't ever settle. Don't think you've arrived. You've, you can never get to the fullest depths of this word. There's always more. And if you're at a low point, right? You, you've fallen out of practice. You're not really reading it outside of Sundays. Then just recommit. If you've never started reading this word, start today. It doesn't matter near as much as what has led to today as it does what you will do from here. Uh, a few months back, I preached a funeral for a lady by the name of Evelyn Kuhn back in the States. And she was what I thought was a really long-time member of our church. 
Uh, because when I showed up there in, in 2010, uh, I met her and she had such a vibrant faith that I wrongly assumed that she had been a lifelong Christian. And so I was shocked to discover later that she was an orphan growing up. Uh, she bounced from foster home to foster home. She never once knew uh, who her parents was, never went to any kind of church till she was in her, in, late in her 50s. And later in her life, uh, her, she and her husband were looking for hope because he got a uh, cancer diagnosis and they told him he only had a few months to live. And they ended up walking into our church in Terre Haute, Indiana, and they found Jesus. And uh, like two months after her husband was baptized and she was as well, he passed away. And then Evelyn stayed in the church. And so Evelyn, a brand new believer in her late 50s, just began devouring the Word of God. She had a passion for it. She learned it. She grew immensely. She went, she went to every Bible study there was. She boarded stuff for herself. And so when I come walking in 15 years later, I saw what I thought was the fruit of decades and decades and decades of faith. And the last visit I had with her before death, I won't ever forget. Parkinson's was, was taking pretty much all of her health. She required round-the-clock care. She lost all her, her independence. She, she was very limited in what she could do physically, almost no mobility. But as I sat there and I talked with her, sitting right beside her was her Bible. And what she wanted to talk about that day was that. She told me how she just finished the book of John for like the 50th time and that she was going into Ephesians and, and what the Lord had been revealing for her. And she was just reading God's word every day because her passion for the inspired living word remained high until her final breath. Now we're all sinners, right? There's not a one of us that doesn't need the grace of Jesus. There's also not a one of us that doesn't need a deposit of truth. There's not one of us that doesn't need teaching and rebuking and correcting and training and equipping and wisdom and hope. And we've been given all of that in God's word. So we must have a relationship with it. And we must be in it. We must be shaped by it. We must be discipled by it more than we are the other voices in this world. And that relationship needs to carry us for the rest of our days. Because God's word is not something we ever graduate from. It's not something we ever outgrow our need for. And so the challenges are simple. Elevate your view of God's word. Let his word go to work on you and have it be an integral part of the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. God, we thank you that we can know you today because you have revealed yourself to us in your inspired divine word. Thank you that it's useful for teaching. Thankful. Thank you that it, that it carries in it wisdom that leads to salvation. Thank you that it's profitable for us. And thank you that it equips us. God, of all the gifts you've given us, one of the greatest is this word. And so help us not to neglect it. Help us to have a passion for it. Lord, give us, give us a heart and a zeal for your word. So that we may be shaped by it, transformed by it. Not hardened to it, but softened to it, God conformed to the teachings of it so that you could get more and more glory from us. I thank you for this church. I thank you for uh, the new beginnings here in Potsdam. And I pray that as, as this group progresses forth, that the word of God will be the living, active foundation of all they do here. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.